<coughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name's Clive Rose, and this is my business partner, Briny. Um, we first met a few years ago when we were working for uh, Burford Garden Company. Um, I was involved in uh, their branding, brand marketing, and um, Bryony was the head of marketing there. Um, and we spent a lot of time chatting about branding and what branding is. Um, and we decided to form uh, our own company, um, Fletcher and Rose Marketing Mentors. Um, uh, and ever since then, we've been working with small companies, helping them get their brand messaging right um, and helping them find uh, their unique propositions um, and really everything to do with uh, branding, communications and marketing. Yeah, 100%. And I would say in the title that we said this is a talk aimed at retailers, but equally, everything that we're going to talk about today could be applied to a supplier or a product run business. So these are our sort of what we're going to share with you today is some of our branding philosophy and also how we've applied it in the context of a garden center, Yarnton Home and Garden, where we are currently very much involved. So, yeah. 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 So without further ado, how to build a strong retail brand. Um, before we talk about how to build a brand, I think we need to define um, what a brand is and what a brand isn't. Um, a brand isn't a logo. It's not an advertising campaign. It's not um, a color palette or a set of brand guidelines. Um, and it's not a a brand is an outcome. A brand is what your customers walk away with in their minds after they've experienced what you've got, to, got on offer. Um, it's your reputation. Um, it's really important to remember this because throughout the customer's journey through their experience with your product or brand or service, you have to be consistent with your messaging so that you never lose track of who you are and what your brand identity is. But you can't do it just simply by putting some nice colors together in a logo. It's to do with the whole experience, the whole, if you're a retail store, it's the shopping experience from the moment your customer walks through the door to the moment they leave, they are experiencing the brand. So, a brand is the sum of all the parts of what you offer. But of course, logos and the brochures and all the other stuff are important in brand communication. So they're tools for extending your reach beyond bricks and mortar. Um, so that's important as well. But I think unless you've got the basics right, the fundamentals right about your business and who you are, you're going to struggle because you will go down a winding road which will eventually turn into a bit of a mess. So if you can identify who you are clearly as a business mm. and think about it creatively and think about it from a customer point of view, um, then you can build, build on that. So as I said before, we've worked with... Um, uh, Burford Garden Company, and then our latest project has been with Yarnton Home and Garden, where we completely rebranded them. When we, well, actually, when Briny invited me along to see Yarnton Home and Garden, I wanted to just run away and hide, as indeed did most of their customers. Um, it, it was a horrible place to be. Um, but the people that were running it at the time were completely oblivious to this. Um, so we came in, we looked at the whole business from top to bottom. Mm. So it wasn't about just creating a logo or a brand identity. In fact, I'll just flick back. Um, it wasn't just about producing this identity. It was about understanding how the product range is related to the customers, mm. how the um, environment 
uh, affected people on uh, an emotional level and on a social level. Um, we had to go through the whole thing from, from top to bottom. Um, the, uh, we came up with this lovely little logo called, and the character in the middle was named by the local children in the community and is known as Twiggy. Um, the idea behind it was that um, Yarnton as a brand was about the home. So home and nature, the garden, and we felt that our little bird was a friendly character that would appeal to children and families, because this is a family-orientated business. It's a little bit different to the Burford business that we worked on, which was a, a bit more kind of upmarket, um, uh, you know, a whole different offering, really. Um, mm. Have you got anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, no, just that um, the idea behind the bird is obviously that they're a nest maker, which is where the home came in, and then they're a nature lover. And we also did a lot of market research um, to arrive at the whole brand and the direction we were taking the company. And bird care, as anyone in garden centre business knows, that's, that's one of your best-selling ranges. So for us, it just felt like there was an awful lot of synergy with the bird, didn't it? So, so we, as I said, we went through the whole store... Um, we work with um, one of our friends called Celia, who is a brilliant um, merchandiser, um, and completely relayed out the store, changed pretty much everything, including, I think, um, Briny looked at the whole product range and the buying strategy and changed all of that. So this isn't just um, a case of going in and doing a bit of graphic design. It, it goes throughout the, throughout the store. And the important thing with the brand is that you do have a consistent voice, consistent messaging. Um, it's really difficult within especially a larger envir um, st uh, store environment or larger business where you have lots of different in in, um, influencers involved, lots of different members of staff that all have a, their own idea of what you should be and they all want mm. to play around with it and add things. So. Um, it's sometimes very difficult to keep on message, but I think if you can instill the right culture in a company by involving everybody in the branding process, then you can make it part of the company's DNA. And once you achieve that, then it's much, much easier to keep, keep the whole thing going. So, branding... I think most people would agree is for the shopper is about identity. So we share the brands we love with our friends. We recommend brands that we love. And that's why it's so important that we, um, when we're branding, that we connect with people on an emotional level. It's too easy to produce what I call overly slick corporate messaging. That's the, that's the easy thing to do, and that's what most people gra gravitate towards. Um, but what we try to do is um, have a much more warmer, much more emotional approach to all the work that we do. Um, and that means that sometimes we deliberately make it a bit rough around the edges and that we look at the language that we use to communicate and we try to avoid all corporate speak and jargon and keep things human. Because in the end, um, shopping, buying stuff is all about community and coming, bringing people together. So brands are an expression of our identity. Um, I, I'm sure that everyone would agree with that. What do you think? Well, even if you don't realise it. Even if you don't realise it, yes. So the car you drive, the shoes you yeah. wear. Yeah. So a lot of the things I do with one-to-one -one clients is get them to shout out the brands that they shop from or that they're wearing. You know, even the supermarket you choose to go to, you're aligning with something by choosing that supermarket. You're aligning with a set of values. So. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree with that. 
So I think is um, quite often what businesses do, understandably, is all the energy goes into the numbers. All the money, all the energy goes into, um, you know, the bottom line, profit and loss. Absolutely right. You can't run a business unless cash flow works. You know, cash is king. Um, but the thing to remember is that the the numbers are a measure of your success in a way. And so you have to think in terms of um, cause and effect. So if you do the merchandising bit right and the branding bit right, then you've got something to measure at the end of the day, which becomes your profit and loss. Mm. Um, if you think that branding and design and the customer experience is something that's a kind of bolt-on thing that some creative person bothers you with, which gets in the way of your business, then, you know, that's really not, not the way to go. Because the thing about branding is that branding is a way of creating a sustainable business. It's, it's a way of adding value. And it's, it's very much real value. So you've probably all heard the term brand equity. And I've certainly met a lot of people that have sort of said, oh, brand equity, Phew, what the hell is that? You know, you can't, you can't put a, a value on it. But if you actually go, if you actually look at the stock market and you look at all the top brands, um, you'll find that they spend absolutely millions and millions on building brands and building relationships with people because the cost of acquiring customers is huge. If you don't build a sustainable brand, then those customers come and those customers go. Mm. But in order to bring down that cost of acquisition, you need repeat purchases. Now, obviously, in a retail store environment, it's a little bit easier to get those return purchases if you're in a particular, if you're on the high street, for instance, you know, people are passing day in and day out. But um, if you want to create real value for your company going into the future, then I would say that brand marketing is the way to go. And even when you come to the point of exit, you know, you come to, to the end of your time with a business and you decide you're going to sell it, the brand equity will add huge value to the sale of that company. So branding is not some kind of creative mm -hmm. um, nonsense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually Sometimes really, really it important. <laughs> Sometimes it is. It's good fun, yeah, sure. But usually for an effect. So retail, as everyone knows, is all about experience. And I think particularly during the pandemic, um, when all of a sudden customers didn't have a choice, the only place to go and get their shopping fix was to go online, there was this what was felt was a tipping point where everyone was suddenly going to become completely online shoppers and not bother going to a store ever again. Well, I think that was a slight exaggeration because, as we all know, when things were lifted, people flooded back to retail stores. And I think the reason for that is because we're social animals and we need to have contact with people. Um, shopping online is a transactional process, but shopping in a store is much more of an experience. Mm. And I kind of think about it in terms of um, 2D versus 4D. Mm. So online shopping is like a two-dimensional experience. It's just you on your own with a screen. But a retail experience is four-dimensional, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Attention. Oh. <laughs> right, hello. <laughs> We'll compete. just break for a moment. Yeah, don't <laughs> Grab yourself a toaster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so retail is a four-dimensional a four experience. So um, the great thing about a store is that you can create drama at every turn. And the way that you uh, merchandise products and create... Um, uh, exciting experiences in store is what keeps people in the store and spending time and hopefully spending money. So it's really important that um, 
mer the merchandising of your store and the internal brand experience uh, is really oriented around, um, I, I guess it's almost like entertainment. Um, and, you know, we have to remember that every single touch point in that experience is important. So every member of staff has the opportunity to have a positive or negative effect on your, on your brand. So I've been doing a lot of talking, <laughs> and I'm aware that my partner here has been sitting here saying nothing. So over to you, Brian. very patient. No. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, obviously, what Clive has just told you about is our kind of is is big head stuff, so sort of lofty um, lofty statements, and it's how do you take these principles of branding, and, and like Clive said, we don't believe branding is just a logo. So, how do you embody these principles into action in your business, either a retailer or a supplier? Um, storytelling is absolutely key. But I thought today it would be useful for you to take home five tips um, of some of the things that I've um, applied to the Yarnton home and garden setting. So I had a long think about this because it could have been 100 tips. But I was thinking, OK, what are the five things that I can tell you that are going to be of most value to you in your own businesses, whether you're product supplier, retailer, it doesn't matter. We're all part of the same supply chain. So if you could do number one. <laughs> So the first thing is getting social. So like Clive touched on, we are all emotional beings. And it doesn't matter if you're selling B2B or B2C, you are selling to a person. And whilst we think that our decision making is rational, it rarely is, if never. Um, we are driven unconsciously as well as consciously by a lot of associations that we already hold, which sway the way that we purchase and make decisions. Um, so the first thing I'd say is social connections are so valuable in any business because they form memories and bonds that will really stand the test of time. So at Yarnton, what I really wanted to do is become a space where there was a lot of room for sort of social networking and bonding. So we did take to social media in a big way and we've gone for, you know, at the time, looking at resource, you can't do it all, we chose Instagram and Facebook and also LinkedIn from a recruitment point of view more. But that's been absolutely huge for us because it's provided this platform where we can have really informal communications with our customers, direct to customer, and we've been able to garner amazing feedback, we've been able to talk to them about ideas, and they've been able to feed into our journey, so our brand story. We were always about, and Clive and I, and all the work we do with all businesses, we do not impose anything on anybody. It's about finding the values of the business, where the business is strong, really identifying those values, getting really clear on that, and then helping a business to find the channels and the tools to communicate. It's not about sticking a kind of plaster on a business ever. So at Yarnton, yes, it was really tired and it wasn't an encouraging space to be, but what it was, was a 50-year-old garden center with the community at its heart. So that, for me, was immediately one of the things I like, latched onto, that the people in this business and the people that come to this business love it for the sense of community it brings. So we've really brought that to life across social media, but also in-store with loads of events, small, a whole range of events. So we do sort of non-paid-for social events right down to workshops that people can pay and come and do. So I would really advise any business to really invest time, although it feels slightly luxurious being on social media, the investment is huge of actually just really investing time, getting social with your customers. So number two is building loyalty. And for me, I always say to people that when they come and approach me to help them write a marketing strategy, the second question I'll ask them is, but do you have a retention strategy? To which they say no. And I would say arguably your retention strategy is more important than your marketing strategy. It is five times harder to get a new customer to buy from you than it is to get a returning one to come back. So you're in a much easier position by maintaining and building loyalty. 
And it's absolutely key, and I think we've seen it in a post-COVID world where loyalty really matters. It's what kept, you know, loyalty was what made the decision between businesses staying alive or, or drowning during COVID. If a business had a loyal following, they would flock to however they'd pivoted and support that business because they are invested in it personally going back to the things that Clive was explaining at the beginning because it represented their status and their value and they care. And people will follow brand journeys. For instance, I followed Finisterre, the surf brand, right from when it was a tiny, tiny business. In fact, they had three people in a caravan in Cornwall to streets, you know, to shops on Oxford Street. So people will really get behind your business, but only if you give them a reason to do so. So loyalty and a retention strategy is just absolutely key. And by that, from a garden center point of view, I'm looking at the lifetime value of each customer and how we can add value to their lives in their, in their interactions with us in store, but also keep them coming back to us. So one of the second things I did after we rebranded was put in place a loyalty scheme, which was based around the idea of friendship. So I don't use the word loyalty in my marketing because it's too corporate and jargony. But what we want to say is that let's be friends and, and in return for that sustained loyalty, we'll give you meaningful discounts. You'll be the first in the know for various things. And you know you, we care what you say, we'll listen to your feedback, et cetera, et cetera. And that's been huge. And we've got over 14,000 loyalty holders in a two year period, which is just incredible. And I was so relieved that when we had to shut open, shut open, that I then had that portal to talk to all of those people so they didn't arrive expecting the store to be open. So I would certainly recommend in your own businesses to go back and just say, okay, we've got this loyal cus customer base. How are we treating them? Are we doing what we can? Could we just put a handwritten note in the post to them? Should we hold an event for them? Just just show them that you're invested in them and that will come back in, in leaps and bounds for your business. But it has to be authentic, doesn't it? 100%. I mean, you have, to, yeah. you have to be really invested in it, in the process. It's very difficult to do these things if you're not really committed to it and, and if you don't mean it. You have to mean it. You have to genuinely care. And if you yeah. mean it, you'll find all, the messaging will come very easily and ideas for how you can keep that relationship going will come easily um, and actually it's the fun bit yeah and I think it's nothing new really because shopkeepers since the year dot have always understood that their business depends on the relationships with their customers um, but sometimes it gets forgotten when things grow a little bit bigger and we all get bogged down in the day-to-day -day technicalities of running a business but it really is something you have to keep going so um, the power of visual merchandising. So we are really fortunate enough to have Celia um, at Yanton Home and Garden, and she's a member of the um, Visual Display Society. And I think where, we, um, where we've managed to create some magic is that she really understood brand, and she educated us around visual merchandising. And the two together are such a powerful force. Um, what she's done is we set about identifying our brand values very clearly based on the business we already had and the business we wanted to create. So things like um, community is one of them, trying to be sustainable wherever we can is another, family is a huge value for us, the natural world obviously being a garden centre is very important. So these values that underpin everything we do, they're part of our induction process, for all new staff, but Celia has really run with these. So she will use visual merchandising to bring multi-sensory experiences to our customer around our key values. So to give you some examples, we massively invested in the duration chairs from Lifestyle Garden, and we were then approached by them, which was a huge compliment because we got so behind them to launch their social plastic chairs. And what we did in displays, we could have just put them out with all the other furniture and done a little sign, but we didn't. We've used that opportunity to create a really interactive display and we've got big boards with information and we've got sea plastic examples. So she's really brought it to life for the customer. And while she's not here today, she's, you know, she's a wealth of knowledge and really taught me a lot actually 
because your digital branding and you're like, we've always had to keep up with each other because sometimes the digital presence has raced ahead and she's rushing to keep up and then I have to keep up with her. So it's this constant thing that's a good thing to have of just sort of chasing each other, but making sure that the brand, the brand is aligned internally and externally. So if you've seen us on a digital touch point, you're not disappointed when you come in store and vice versa. So it's really about marrying, marrying those two disciplines has been key. Yeah, and Celia, um, the amount of energy that Celia brings to this is incredible. Yeah. And, it, and it's never ceasing. She's thinking about it all the time. Mm. Um, responding to how uh, people react to what she does in store. So it's not a case of, you know, as I say, everyone in retail knows that it's something that you have to keep moving, you have to keep changing and keep people interested, um, you know, from season to season. Um, and Celia brings so much energy to it and so much creativity to it. Cre creativity is at the heart of, of everything. Um, and I think a great example of that is actually... Uh, and I don't think I'm being a traitor saying this, but um, Burford Garden Company is probably one, if anyone knows them, if anyone, uh, anyone's visited them, knows that they are probably one of the most creative garden centres in the country. And they are hugely successful for that as well. And the reason for that is because they are creative from top to bottom. You know, the owners are creative people and they are interested in creating a store that they are proud of and that they find exciting is full of theatre, full of new ideas, full of great new products, but they all align to the values that they've set out. Um, so I think if you want a great example of how a retail brand can flourish, I would say go visit Burford Garden Company. Yeah, and I would. And then come to Yarnton. Yeah, then come to Yarnton, spend lots of money. No, I would say as well that Celia and I have had a lot that kind of what we do is fluffy and it's sort of, oh, you know, it's a nice to have. And I think what we've proven at Yarnton is it's absolutely not fluffy hmm. and it's not nice to have. It's, it's an absolutely essential. essential to have and it absolutely affects the bottom line. So when you've got directors making decisions about investment, this is. And especially in a recession, this is exactly where that investment should go. Yeah, and talking of recessions, that often in a recession, the first things that get cut mm. are marketing and visual communications. It's a huge mistake. These huge are the channels mistake. that mm. are going to sustain you, help sustain your business. Um, they're the communication channels. Yeah. So number four sounds really, really boring, but it's often overlooked. So people sort of have a flurry at marketing and branding and then sort of get bored or distracted or don't allow for proper resource. You need to identify your brand messages. You need to stick to your messages and then you need to consistently communicate them across the channels that you've chosen. And by that, I don't mean be active on social media for four months and then give up for four months or decide to set up a newsletter and be inconsistent with it. Like any relationship we have, we value those friendships where we get consistent communication and feedback with that person. If you had a friend that just dropped off the radar and came back, you know, you're immediately feeling quite distrustful. So although it can feel a little bit salesy, and I certainly don't think most of your communication should be salesy, it should be nurturing, just be really, really consistent with it. So make sure that before you start anything, you allocate time and resource to be consistent. And the other thing is, I get, well, we get it all the time. Can you rebrand us? Why? Well, we're bored of our logo. Absolutely not. Your logo's got loads of equity in it. The brand messages has got loads of equity on it. So although you might get bored with your own brand and your own business, because you're talking about it every day, your customer or your ideal prospective customer is seeing that as familiarity. So they're actually getting that know, like, and trust through you being consistent. So I and, would... And can I just jump in? Yeah, but of course. Familiarity sells. Yes. Familiarity is incredibly powerful. The music yes. industry knows this. That's why every other song you hear on the radio sounds the same. It's because familiarity sells. And, you know, people love to know... People love to recognize something, go, yes, I know that, I'll, I'll yeah. have a piece of that. And I would say at this point that an omni-channel, which you may have heard banded around that word, 
marketing strategy is a good one. So that's where the same customer might come across you at Glee, on social media, in store, and you are sort of, you are in their world more holistically than just one place. So that's the other thing. I've made sure that we've, we've got a consistent message growing, going across various channels where I know that our desired audience hang out, basically. Yeah. You can have a lot of fun with the messaging as well. It doesn't mean that it has to be literally the same message. No. It just means <laughs> no, that don't the say the same thing on repeat. Find creative ways to yeah. say the same thing. It's kind of like a, a tone of voice. It's yeah. the way you speak. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, once, uh, and you know, once you've established that, this is the great thing, once you've established what that tone of voice is, it becomes easier and easier and easier. And as we all know, in our very busy lives, the easier something is, the more likely we are to keep going with it. Yeah, it becomes and a habit. It, it also becomes yeah. instinctive. And your brand becomes a personality of its own. So you're not thinking, well, I never think in terms of when I'm working with businesses, what do I want? I think, what does Yarnton need? What does their audience need? What do the customers want? So you're able to kind of take that on as a persona and a life force in and of itself separate to you, which means that you're building longevity that you're, you know, not do myself out of a job, but your marketing manager can, le can leave or your brand manager can leave and you've left enough of a personality for someone to come and run with it. I know the personality of this brand. I know what they care for. I know how they feel and they can just get, and that builds longevity and that builds brand equity because it's not reliant on one person. I'd, I'd just like to add one sort of caveat to this oh, and gosh. <laughs> here we go um, we have a fight? and that is that when we say you have to keep your brand messaging consistent and you have to be consistent what we don't mean is that you don't change yes all brands keep evolving um, as you get feedback as the world changes around you you have to be ready to move but just don't make massive steps. These are, this is an, an evolutionary process yeah. that is responsive. Um, and so you can't just simply go, well, I've done it now. Brian no. has come up with an idea. I'll just, yeah. I can just do that now forever and everything will be fine. You have to evolve. And sustainability is a really good example. So we were nowhere in a position where we could make lofty claims about being highly sustainable, but we knew as a company and as people in it that we all deeply cared about the environment. So what we've done is we review that policy every year and work out what more we can add to take a step towards where we want to be. And we communicate that with the customer rather than making a grand statement that could easily become unstuck we say, you know, this is where we would like to be. The, these are the efforts that we're making to go on this journey, but we need you, the customer, to invest in the ocean plastic pots and to buy the duration chairs in order to carry on on that journey. So it's about taking the customer with you and adapting as a brand, and that's what I mean by consistency. And like Clive's rightly pointed out, it's not s sticking with one message only, it's just being very transparent about who you are and why you're that way and taking the customers on that journey with you in an evolutionary way. You're right. I'll give you that. Thanks. Um, so number five, obviously, is the final one, and Clive has touched on it already. But I would take time to go home after this session and review your customer journey. And what I mean by that is every single touch point. That could be a bio on social media, that could be your website, that could be purchasing something off your website, it could be their experience in your shop lose, it could be any point at which your customer and your business comes into contact. Just go and look at it through your customer's eyes. So try and detach yourself from the operational side of your business and everything else, and just go and look at it with fresh eyes and see what it's telling you. And if you find that too hard, which it is when you're really involved in the business, you know, it's a good idea just to ask someone to do it for you and just review those touch points. And then at each of those touch points, say to yourself, is my brand values clear? Are, is the messaging clear? Digitally, always have a call to action. So always have a next step of what you want your customer to do next. They've got to the point where they're on your website or they're on your social media. They want to know what the next step is. It's like any friendship, you know, where are we meeting next? What are we doing next? How do we continue this journey? And then in store, I say to absolutely everyone that works in our business, 
every single act in this business is a marketing act. This isn't like a, I'm not like a tag on department. Like the job of our shop floor staff is way more important than mine, way more important. They're the ones that are gonna keep that customer coming back and give that customer a really special moment. So I'd say look at all your touch points, whether you're supplier, retailer, or a product, whatever bit of the supply chain you come from today, and just really make sure that you're adding as much value you can across those touch points. And of course, being human, we tend to remember that single bad experience. We do. Above you can put loads of energy into creating you know, a wonderful experience for the customer, but it's that one little thing that stands out and the one little thing that becomes the seed of um, negativity. So it is really, uh, it's not like you can never make a mistake or you can't slip up, but if you do slip up, then I would go back to um, tip number one, which is be social. social. Because mm -hmm. social is also a channel to ena enable you to address um, any concerns that customers have and make sure that you're on it and you get there and, and sort it out. So let's try and avoid those little um, niggly things. That you know, and that's the thing. You will, you, know, you will get it wrong. And marketing can feel quite scary because you're like, Am I, I'm not a marketeer. You know, lots of people are doing their marketing as with a different hat on. You know, not every organization can afford to have dedicated marketers but I would say you know it's fine to make mistakes as long as you're honest and transparent about it um, and if you've got a strong brand people will stick with you they'll go along with the journey yeah. yeah I mean I think a, a prime example is I don't know whether I should say this but v, VW who um, cheated the um, emissions tests with their software. If they'd have been a weak brand, they wouldn't be around anymore. Mm. But they're a strong brand that people like, and people will stick with them. They've taken a massive hit, but the brand is robust. And you'll see that time and time again with very, very strong brands, that they do weather storms very, very well. But the weaker brands, the ones that are not so loved, who cares, they can go, and often they do. And the weaker brands are the ones that haven't created an imprint in the human mind. Yeah. I mean, I'm obsessed with sort of neuromarketing, so what goes on in the unconscious as well as the conscious from a branding point of view. And by creating a social frisson, you're creating a memory and an association, which that human brain will then unconsciously re recall back and form an opinion on. So you can think about it in relation to why you like certain names mm. and why you don't like other names. And it will be because you prob maybe have a memory of being bullied at school by a, you know, Janet. I hope there's not a Janet here. I'm sure she's not a bully. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that, it's that. So I always say to clients, if I sat you um, in a room full of people that knew about your brand and I asked them to shout out one word about your brand, what words would you want them to be shouting back to you? So if you take those words that you want your customers to be shouting back to you and you apply that to your brand messaging and live it, so in an integral way, then you'll embody your brand and you'll get back what you want from your customer, so it's circular. So I think that's. I think what we're going to do is. Is it questions? It's, I yeah. Think it's question so we'd time, love to it? take some questions, or thoughts, or anything you disagreed with or agreed with. Yeah, that'd be good. If it was a, if it was a discussion, it would be good. It's a it? discussion. <laughs> oh, I know what it feels like. I, I never have a oh, question. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Janet Major from Zest for Leisure. Funny about the Janet, I did laugh. <laughs> um, I want to talk, talk about the DMU, the decision making unit, and whether that's applied to trade or whether it's applied to consumer, about the influences around us when we're making a buying decision in the garden centre, for example. And can you give us any advice on that? How can we best influence those decisions that are made in that retail? environment in a meet in a meeting environment with a buyer 
Uh, no, in a retail environment. In a, what, sorry. So the, to trip a customer into a decision, you mean around yes, buying? Yeah, say trip. Yeah, not trip. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> trip. Yeah. It's trip. trip. It, yeah. yeah, it's about yeah. that buying decision. Yeah. So I would say, um, I mean, I'm also I'm also the buyer for Yant and Home and Garden by mistake. Um, I was only doing it for a year in order to have something to market, but now I seem to still be doing it three years on, and loving it, actually. And I think it, it's, it's a, again, it's a holistic thing. So I'm buying products that really fit with our brand values and what we're trying to achieve as a business. And I've done my market research, so I know my customers are gonna come in and, and want this product, because I know, I've really got to know them. I know their demographic. I, I, you know, we did a lot of research at the beginning. And I think that's where the VM comes in, is we find that if we create the lifestyle aspiration, so if we just shove a product on the shelf, it doesn't do very well. But if we put a whole range of products around a key theme, so we create visual themes, then we find that we have a lot more sales and we also have upsell into other products. So I think storytelling is absolutely key because what's happening in the human mind is you're telling them how that product will apply in their lives, but also you're working into where they want to be, so that where they see themselves in the pack, so the status. So you might fancy yourself as a well-to-do Cotswold lady with a lovely garden, and we put together beautiful tables and you've got the fire pit and you've got the whole upsell of what goes with that lifestyle aspiration and we find that that has massively helped drive up our average transaction value which was very 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 low when we started and that's actually the figure i'm looking at a lot more than say the daily revenues is that that what's in that basket and what are people buying and are they associated products so that would be my advice is to, to create the storytelling for a customer to make it really easy for a customer to understand why they need that product. A customer doesn't look at a product and sit there going, I need this product because of this, this, and this. It's all going on in the unconscious. So you're sort of making it really easy, that decision really easy for them. It's all about serotonin. It's all about serotonin. It's emotional. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, my name's Emily. I'm from a company called Redfish Group. So we do kind of marketing similar to you guys. Um, and we've recently launched a loyalty app um, for some customers, um, including garden centres, which is why we're at Glee. Um, but it was just coming back to your point about loyalty. And you, you found that like the, the jargon around the term loyalty or rewards isn't as friendly as what, and I really liked what you'd done with the, the Friends of Yarnton. I just kind of wanted, you know, if, if you've got anything else kind of to say on that, if, um, you know, what kind of feedback have you had from it and things? Have, have you found that it's worked a lot better calling it something like Friends of Yarnton rather than a loyalty scheme as such? Yeah, 100%. I think, um, again, words are loaded. So certain words are loaded with certain associations and I think a lot of companies use loyalty but not in a genuine authentic way and and people are not stupid and they soon caught on that the offers weren't that genuine or they'd lowered the prices and that you know that kind of thing so there was a lot of mismarketing going on around loyalty and we didn't want our loyalty scheme which we give really meaningful discounts, so we're not dressing them up, it's not stuff we're trying to get rid of. We give meaningful discounts around seasonal times and we give them heads up. We wanted it to be more about building friendship um, rather than loyalty. Loyalty just felt a little bit remote for us, didn't it? Is it right that we give them cake on their birthday? We do, we give them tea and cake on their cake. birthday. And we did have Cake a is the most powerful marketing tool. Yeah, we made a mistake the other day and we sent the cake voucher, which we were trying to line up for our um, staff, to our entire mailing list. Who <laughs> 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 all said, it's not my birthday, but I'm coming in for cake. So the chef, I got in big trouble because he didn't have enough cake. So he was stealing it from the farm shop. But anyway, <laughs> it was one of those things that we just had to say to customers, look, 
our mistake, your win, you know, you, to your win. And it, luckily it was the Queen's Jubilee. So we said, we're going to honour it for the Jubilee. But yeah, we try, what we've tried to do with the loyalty scheme is give customers what they'd expect. So the discounts monthly, but also just surprise. I think surprise is also just a really, I just love surprise. So I'll say to our cafe, right, just, you know, on that Saturday, just rush out with some fizz and some brownies. Just surprise your customers. Because are you going to go home and say, you know, I bought this lovely bottle of Bramley hand wash? Or are you going to say, I was at Yarnton today and they suddenly popped up with this brownie and it was like really cool? Or we'll put a piano, we'll get a musician in for the day. And so we just try and create sort of surprise because that's what people will go and talk about. And it's those stories that you want people to tell about your business. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I think, yeah, loyalty is a funny one. I just think each center that you work with, I would encourage them to really work out what it means for them rather than them having a blanket loyalty scheme because pe customers will soon see through that. And I think it's about what can you as a center offer? What, what's the value you can add? And garden centers are hidden treasure troves of value. You've got garden people that know so much and then you've got gardeners that want that knowledge you know what what is the value in the business that's unique and how can you share that value so i come at it from a point of adding value to customers lives and every business needs to find their own unique way of doing that it's okay any other questions oh she's got them. hiya my Hello. name is tasha um I am actually going to be starting at a department store which has been going around 250 years. Wow. And we need to rebrand. It's a bit dated, so I appreciate all the tips you're giving us um, and appreciate its small steps. One of the problems I think I'm going to face is that the store staff are quite stuck in their ways oh, yes. and they're a bit resistant to change. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips on kind of how to get them on board and excited about where we're heading in the future? Wow, would, we had exactly that. Issue, yeah, we? I would say that that's been one of the biggest personal learning journeys for me. So you kind of go into a business with this idea that everyone's going to love what you're doing because you love what you're doing and you are met with so much resistance. And it is such a, it has been such a, it's a very, I think education is key. And I didn't understand that the guys that had worked there, and this isn't to do anybody down, because these people are now some of my closest friends and biggest ambassadors. Um, but I definitely had to have a long, hard look at myself and how I wanted to, to approach it, because it was not going to be done in an arrogant way. And I think one of the first things I did was I spoke to every person that worked there, and I just said to them, what makes this place special for you? And, the, and they all came back and said it's the community and that working here feels like a family. So those are two things. I was like, I can never lose that. That's really important for them as, as employees, but also, I think, for the customers. And it was. They were genuinely so caring. Like, our staff would go and set up whole water systems out of hours or deliver their groceries. I mean, I couldn't even tell you the things that our staff would do that went beyond the call of duty. Um, but I think it's about, it's about consultation. So it's about owning your position as an expert in the field of branding and marketing, but not owning it in an arrogant way. So cons consulting everybody that's in the business to understand why it's imp what's important to them about the business. Taking those things and incorporating them into your marketing and branding plan, and then checking in along the way and things like when we redid the uniform, I went and spoke to a lot of people on the shop floor about what they need. I didn't assume I knew what they needed and they weren't wearing cotton and they were, it gets very, very hot and they did not like the polyester. So I fought very hard with the powers that be that although cotton was more expensive and it fades and so we're gonna have to replace the uniform, that they really need cotton uniform, like that's the, that we really need to supply that in a hot or freezing cold environment. So I fought quite hard for what I was told. I educated myself about what they needed and I fought quite hard to get what they needed. 
And then I think we're still in that process, if I'm completely honest. And with new staff, I now do an induction with every single member of staff across the whole business. And it's a brand induction. And that is really valuable. So they get to meet me, but I also explain their role in the whole business as a marketeer, that every act in this business is a marketing act. And that's allowed me to have that conversational link with everybody in the store, which is obviously lovely, and it's formed really good friendships. But they all come back to me and they'll say, oh, I remember what you said about lifetime value of a customer, and I've had, you know, Jane's been in four times, and it's because we did this and we carried her converse to her car. So they're then invested in that journey. And I think it's about never assuming you know best either. So yes, you come with a load of expertise, but they come with... They know their business, they've lived in it, they've breathed it, they know it better than you do. And can they will say, have nuggets of gold. Can I just say something about yeah. um, brand, branding is never just outward facing, it's, it yeah. faces inward as well. So um, the, what I would say to people is, you know, you want to work in a place that, that's a nice place to work, mm. it's a good environment, you know, it's a pleasant environment and, and a friendly environment. And, you know, branding can help achieve this. Well, and again, I'm not talking about graphic design. I'm talking about, you know, creating an experience both for the, um, the people that work in that environment as well as the customers. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you, can, if you can pull that off, it helps bring people along, along with you. And I don't mean that you consult everybody about what the brand should be, mm -hmm. but you certainly do, as Bryony said, you probably have a depth of knowledge about the brand even though it's an old brand they have a depth of knowledge that goes back in history and that history somewhere in that history will be the key to your new brand actually um, it'll be buried in there somewhere and what we do is it's more about finding the brand within a company yeah. not imposing a brand on a company i see this all the time with um uh, graphic design companies, provincial graphic design companies, who go, well, I've got a great idea for a, a, a logo for you and a colour scheme, and, a, and it should be like this. And here are three, here are my three favourites. Choose one. Oh, you don't like them? I'm really upset now. I'm going to go away and throw my things out. It's not about that. Somewhere deep inside the business is the very uniqueness of that business yeah. the the bit the nugget that is going to make the new branding really really work it's there and it's me. the story you know branding is storytelling so we were run by twin brothers for 50 years and they created a legacy and i, I definitely don't want to eradicate any of that you know to me that is our story that's why i'm here that's why i'm in the business so we're really i know when we found it it was a bit lost but we're really proud of that heritage and and we want to build on that and I think if you're going into a business that's already in existence you need to understand the context of the story to date but just to be really clear branding should never be done by committee when it comes to choosing logos because everyone will have a different opinion <laughs> so you have to let your creative director just get on with that bit <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, but just one more thing sorry to go on um, back, it t brings us in a circle really back to the beginning and that is that a logo isn't the brand but what a logo is is it's a trigger so it's a, just a reminder of what exp whatever experience you've had with that brand so again a logo can have negative or positive mm. connotations depending upon the experience, experience that you have yeah. any other questions? I think that's all we've got time oh, for, unfortunately. Okay. Oh, got Sorry, more. but someone oh. might be able to grab you afterwards. If Should we do it after? Is that okay? Sorry, because yeah. we've got another session starting just shortly. Oh, but no, if we sorry. could have a big round of applause Thank for, for Bryony and so Clyde. Much, Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs>